chapter 27. We've been studying through Exodus. If you're joining with us, we've seen their uh, release uh, by the Egyptians, God putting the pressure <clears throat> on Egypt and the Pharaoh. And now they're out in the desert and they are receiving the book of the law. God is laying down some guidelines for his people because truth be told in Galatians, Paul says their uh, transgressions were out of control and God had to put some boundary lines around them. But at the same time, God was setting up the foreshadowing of what was to come in Christ. And as we've been looking through it, we've seen so many things that are pointing to Christ. As we've looked at uh, them uh, uh, meeting with God, the fellowship that God intends, God's presence that we see there, it, <clears throat> God uh, revealing himself through Moses as a Christ type uh, which is very, very powerful. God wanting to deliver his word, God setting up the fellowship. And today, um, we or yesterday, we saw the altar, which really all points to the central focus as to why we can walk with God is through the sacrifices or the sacrifice of Christ. But we saw yesterday how when they set up this tabernacle with the altar, boy, that was the central focus that... <clears throat> It is because of the sacrifice that we can have a relationship with God, that we can be in his presence, which is very, very powerful. So let's get on over to Exodus chapter 27. We're going to pick up where we left off in verse 9. Guys, please excuse me uh, for the cold. Um, so in verse 9, we get into, so we've gotten, we got past the altar, right? Uh, the Holy of Holies and all that. And now we're at the courtyard. And uh, this is this is a, a large area out in front there with the sacrifice, all in the presence of God. Um, I mean, what is this? The tabernacle is the earthly church, right? <laughs> the central focus is Christ with God amongst the people. That central focus of Christ at the altar is what allows God God to be in fellowship with the people. And this courtyard is that fellowship area, if you will. Watch this, very powerful. Verse nine, he says, make a courtyard <clears throat> for the tabernacle. The south side shall be a hundred cubits long and is to have certain curtains of fine twisted linen uh, with 20 posts and 20 bronze bases and with silver hooks and bands on the posts. So they're, they're talking about fencing or the gathering uh, inside an enclosed area. The north side shall also be 100 cubits long and is to have curtains with 20 posts and 20 bronze bases and the silver hooks and bands on the posts. So if you want to see an illustration of what this looks like, go to my profile page. I posted up a 3D rendering of the tabernacle and it gives you a visual of all the things that we're reading. Verse 12, the west end of the courtyard shall be 50 cubits wide and have uh, curtains with 10 posts and 10 bases. On the east end, towards the uh, sunrise, the courtyard shall also have 50 cubits wide, and curtains 15 cubits long are to be on one side of the entrance with three posts and three bases. The curtains 15 cubits long are to be on the other side with three posts and three bases. So he's squaring off an area. He says, for the entrance of the courtyard, provide a curtain, Curtain uh, 20 cubits long of blue, purple, scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen. This is beautiful in every way in the desert. What a, you know, when you think about all these colorful uh, fabrics <clears throat> with the loops and gold rings and all this, imagine the contrast of this in the desert. You know, in the desert, there's not much greenery, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's pale, or should I say it's dry, it's, brown it's 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 dusty but yet then all of a sudden you see this beautiful tapestry beautiful fine colors i love the blue the purple the scarlet but what is this this tabernacle is a uh a, a foreshadowing of what god's fellowship his his gathering of his people will be like and in the world you know you look at the world as a desert right when, whenever they um, mention the desert or the wilderness, <clears throat> that was a um, uh, a way of also saying this is where demonic forces of evil reign. This is the world, 
and all of its corruption. This is where uh, things are sinfully awry. When they had the scapegoat, where did they send the scapegoat in the Old Testament? They sent it out into the wilderness. What was the scapegoat? Well, the scapegoat was sin, and it was cast out of the fellowship into the wilderness because in the fellowship, we are redeemed. We are forgiven. Sin is cast out. So when you look at this courtyard and the beautiful colors, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, finely twisted linen, uh, and, and the work of an embroiderer, I mean, this is beautiful stuff. And when you see this in contrast to the desert, you go, I want to be here at the tabernacle, right? This is this is something that stands out that is beautiful in contrast to the world. And that's what our lives should be a reflection of. Like how you and I live should be something that is so beautiful and contrast the desert living or the worldly living. You are no longer of the world, right? Though we are in the world, we are no longer of the world, right? There's a there's a difference. And, <clears throat> and when God is setting up this tabernacle, boy, what a vivid imagery of how changed we are to be in contrast to the world. The world um, despises humility. The world despises kindness and gentleness and patience. But we embrace these principles. These are beautiful. Notice Jesus says, don't work for things of this world that the moth get in and deteriorate and destroy. But live a life building up treasures in heaven, things that will last. Well, what lasts in heaven? Peace, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, compassion. These, all these characteristics, what do they do? Well, they uh, last for eternity. And, and so <clears throat> God is giving a vivid uh, description and a vivid image here in the tabernacle of how beautiful it is to go the way of God, contrasting the world, which is the desert, right? Very, very powerful. Verse 17, all the posts around the courtyard are to have silver bands and hooks and bronze braces. I mean, look at this, just beautiful. The courtyard shall be 100 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, with curtains of finely twisted linen, five cubits uh, high, with bronze bases, all the other articles used in, now watch this, used in the service of the tabernacle, whatever their function, including all the tent pegs for it, and those for the courtyard are to be of bronze. So it's just this beautiful place where <clears throat> folks can gather literally it, together with one another in the presence of God, and then the sacrifice or the altar of sacrifices did center there, the courtyard with the people. And then we have the Holy of Holies there. And so it's pulling everything together. The central focus there that it brings it together is the sacrifice. That's Christ, which brings together the people of God in the presence of God. So, wow, what a beautiful uh uh, image that God is uh, setting up the Israelites to see and understand, just very powerful. And and the thing that is, um, it's attractive, right? It has fine tapestry. It has uh, uh, craftsmen that are working to beautify something that looks so different than the world, so uh, uh, opposite of what the world values. Now, what does this mean? Well, this is kind of, so when you come in this courtyard, what is it? This is for the fellowship of those that are called on God, as they call it in the Greek, the ecclesia, the called out of God, the ecclesia, that translation to English, that word is church, but it's, it's, its roots are in the word, the Greek word ecclesia, the called out of God. You know, I know when we say the word church, we tend, we generally think of an institution or a building, like that's a church building, right? And they're all, the church buildings are generally distinguishable by how they're made, but that's not what we see in the Bible. Church or ecclesia, it was the called out of God. It was people. It was a recognition of those 
that are called out in service or following God. You, you got me on that? That's what we see. So when you see this tabernacle in the courtyard that's being built here, <clears throat> very powerful illustration of what the unity and the fellowship of the church should be. The church is the one in essence, it is one in essence, because it is founded on one gospel. Just like when you look at that tabernacle, it is it is able to exist because of the sacrifice. The, the called out of God is able to exist because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus is the central figure. It's the unifying figure that allows us to come together as family in unity, but it also allows us to come together in the presence of God. And, and so when you look at <clears throat> the tabernacle and its foreshadowing of the fellowship in the courtyard, you see this in the New Testament as it talks about the church. So we're going to look at the fellowship, the unity of the church, <clears throat> and how that plays itself out in the New Testament, but how it was foreshadowed in the Old Testament in the courtyard. So Romans chapter 12, verse 5. In Romans chapter 12, verse 5, listen to what Paul is saying. Now, mind you, when he writes, <clears throat> guys, I'm so sorry for this cold. I am hurting. <laughs> uh, when Paul writes to the Roman church, there was some division that was happening between Gentile con converts to Christianity and Jewish converts to Christianity. And so he's making the appeal of unity in Christ. And watch what he says in Romans 12, verse 5. He says, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body. So what is he getting at? He's saying there are many of us. And, and, and in this many, in the context of this, we are very diverse. Uh, all of us come from, in, in many ways, many different backgrounds. We have different age and generations. We, we're, uh, our ethnic, ethnicity is different. Our social and economic situations are different. but And so he says, though many, well, what happens? Form one body. You know, and this body comes together where? In the presence of God. We form one body. And watch this. And each member belongs to all the others. This is powerful. You see, I think it's so easy <clears throat> to think that... Um, you know, my walk with God is my walk with God and has nothing to do with anybody else. Well, technically, that's not true. Yes, you do have a walk with God. You do have your own convictions and faith. But Romans 12 says, guess what? You don't belong to yourself. You belong, uh, belongs to all the others. We belong to each other. And when you look at the tabernacle, they all participated in making that thing happen. They all get to come in the courtyard at some point because what? They belong to each other. When one of them messes up, and we see that when they go in the conquer in the land, we see that when the faithless come back, it affects everyone. And God is uh, impressing upon them the idea that you belong to each other. You should be accountable to each other. And not only that, your actions affect each other. So therefore, we belong to each other. That was the what God was trying to impress upon them when they came out of Egypt. And now we see the fulfillment of all of that foreshadowing as Paul discourses it in Romans chapter 12, verse 5. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, when you think about the unity. So these guys in the tabernacle in the courtyard could come together in the presence of God, because of the sacrifice, they could be there in the presence of God, although God was behind a curtain, Christ was going to tear that curtain apart. But then what does that mean about those that gather together, that they're gathering together? The foreshadowing of what God did in the Old Testament is the, is the uh, ful fulfilled in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Listen to what the writer says. <clears throat> Therefore, each of you must put off what? Falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Here it is again. What is he talking about? We are all members of one body. 
He later on in first Corinthians 12 says the body, which is the church or which is the called out of God, right? You see this, right? Speak. How should we deal with each other? Put off falsehood. You know, it's so easy to be deceitful, to lie and not be honest and real with one another. Sometimes in our honesty, we, we try and we get too aggressive because we're insecure about being honest about how we feel. We need to be secure in who we are to one another. We belong to one another. Therefore, we, we can speak truthfully to one another without the hatred, the, the uh, menacing disposition, the anger. So we get so frustrated sometimes with each other. And he says, no, truthful to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. And what is he getting at? <clears throat> we belong to each other. And, and this is powerful when you start talking about what the first what what the first century church was and what we are to be here in the 21st century and and sad to say this is this is convicting because it, it's so hard to find fellowships where people are speaking truthfully to one another where people are acting this way that we see written out in the scriptures where all the members are part of one body. There's a family, right? <clears throat> um, just, just very, this is challenging, but that's God's intended purpose. And, 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 and when, when you look at the Old Testament tabernacle in Exodus chapter 27, you see the tabernacle, you see the courtyard, you see the sacrificial or the altar of sacrifice there. <clears throat> it, it's the central point. It's like, what has brought this together is the sacrifice of the lamb. And so in the New Testament, the, the, what has brought us together is Christ. Christ is the central figure, which should make us all be humble about ourselves and learn to love one another just like Christ loved us when we were the enemy. So there, there's a, you know, that, that, that iconic image of Christ as the central figure in our in our tabernacle today, this is what we must do. And 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 it's it's powerful. First Corinthians 12, verse 12, it says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So what is he getting at? In first Corinthians 12, he said, Look, there are many parts, many functions, many gifts, many talents, you know. When you look at the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 27, it took many different skill sets to, to build <clears throat> and to construct what they were building, what God had told them. Everybody had a different gift set. And, um, and, and so when you look at the fulfillment of that in the first century, he says, what is it? Just as a body, though one, it has many parts. We are a body. We are a collective gathering of those who call on God. But... Each of us brings something different to the table. But notice what he says, the one. There's a unity about this. And this is what we must demand of each other, is to be unified, to fight for unity. Jesus is uh, one of his last prayers about humanity was unity. That, that was what he knew uh, as being one of the greatest challenges and Shortly before he departs, he prays about what? Unity. Because he knows our sinful nature, you know, even in our pursuit of God, in our pursuit of being Christ-like, we struggle <clears throat> with being unified. We struggle with accepting one another and being able to work through conflicts with one another. We we and 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 some of the most fierce arguments happen amongst those who call on the name of Jesus. And, and we've got to realize, man, this is not God's intended purposes. Thank you, Meg, for the roses. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys' gifts are awesome. I really appreciate it. But this is what we see in the text. Now, remember, the tabernacle is trying to embed upon us what's happening in the spiritual realm. So what he's saying is, when we come together, as a fellowship, as a body of Christ, God is present. And so when they were in that courtyard, they saw the presence of God with the cloud, right? Whoa, the fire, the glory, whoa, 
So it was like, act like you're in the presence of God, right? So we need to understand in the New Testament, we are in the presence of God. And we'll get into some of that with the Holy Spirit in the next section. But man, we're in the presence of God. So that should create great unity in our hearts because at the central focus of why we can be in the presence of God was Jesus exemplifying great humility and dying on the cross. Very, very powerful. Colossians, now turn over to Colossians, or 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So that doesn't mean that we all think the same. <clears throat> there are many different parts, but we all create one body, one church, which is very powerful. Uh, the church transcends all barriers. One of the things that is powerful about the New Testament is that um, unlike what happened there in Egypt, it was just the Israelites and there were a few scattered foreigners within them. And uh, what we see, because he, when he writes out the law, he talks about foreigners coming in and being a part that they would convert and, and so forth. Um, but what we see here in Colossians or in the New Testament is that God has transcended all barriers. So in other words, he's pulling everyone together from every nation. Why? Because that was his initial dream with Abraham. All nations will be blessed, right? His promise to Abraham is that all nations would be blessed through him. And when Jesus leaves in Matthew 28, what does he leave with? Go and make disciples of what? All nations. So God's dream begins with all nations being blessed. Christ leaves this earth with the dream now going to be fulfilled by going and make disciples of all nations. And so the fellowship then wants to be a reflection, transcending all barriers. Wow. Very powerful. Colossians chapter 3 in verse 11. Listen, as Paul talks to the church there in Colossae, what does he get at? He says, here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Very powerful here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. What is he getting at? He's getting at our identity is no longer uh, a description of worldly titles and worldly tags. He says, no, here there's neither Gentile nor Jew. I mean, think about that. He is really going after, we have a new identity in Christ, a whole new identity. It's so easy for us to identify with our race, our culture, what country we're from, right? <clears throat> it's so easy to identify with those things. But what God is saying, I'm giving you a new identity in Christ, a new identity in Christ. Very powerful. No Jew, no Gentile, none of that, right? We are all created in something new, right? No barbarian. You know, it's so easy with Chip. What, what's your nationality? Or who are I? Oh, I'm African-American, right? And I get it, right? But that's not my identity. My identity is in Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when we come together in that fellowship, as we, we can call it the courtyard, uh, we come together in the presence of God, identifying with God, right? Because we are all, Christ is in all and is in all. Very, very powerful. And we throw off the, the worldly distinctions, and we have a new distinction in Christ. Watch what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, because his, he's dealing with this hostility um, that is there. In Colo uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, what does he say? For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier and the dividing wall of hostility. Well, what is he getting at in Ephesians? He's getting at the, <clears throat> the, the barrier of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. There was a serious racial issue between these two cultures. Well, it's really one culture and every other culture. 
And what does he say in Ephesians 2.14? He himself is our peace. Well, what brought peace to the racial uh, tensions that were there? Christ, who has made the two groups what? One, Christ has brought together the, the dysfunction of race and racial prejudice. He's brought that together so that they are one and has destroyed the barrier and the dividing wall of what? Hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, because he destroyed that. There was a barrier of hostility that came from the law, right? Because out of Israel, they were the people, and it was, and it created a barrier of hostility, and Christ destroyed that, the dividing wall, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands. He ended the law. The law was obsolete, it was weak and miserable, as Paul describes it. Hebrew writer says it was obsolete, and Christ set it aside for a intended purpose to create unity amongst the people. God wants unity. Its commands and his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. So what's Christ's intention? He wanted to create a new humanity. Do you hear this? a new humanity <clears throat> out of two making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. Wow. Very, very powerful there in every way. What is he wanting to produce? Unity. He's wanting to pull together two groups that were hostile towards each other, racial tension by giving us what? A new identity. Uh, and and it's and it's very powerful. John chapter ten, Jesus says, "I have other sheep that you you don't know about. I want to bring them in." Even when Jesus was there, he was talking about pulling in other nations, other folks that were different. He wanted a diverse group that came together under a new humanity, a new identity, and that identity was founded in Christ. Well, what's that mean? that we absorb ourselves with being more like Christ than being like ourselves. It's so easy to say, well, this is my culture. I want, this is what I need. This is what everybody should understand it. But no, he's saying, make your culture me. Make your identity me. And Christ gives us his identity, peace, joy, patience, kindness, uh, 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 forgiveness, right? Does not keep any wreck. This is the identity of Christ. And therefore, that should be what we pursue. And it's so easy to get caught up in our own sense of identity, our own sense of who we are, rather than being caught up in being like Christ. And so when you look at the courtyard here in Exodus chapter 27, boy, is it a powerful imagery of what God was going to do in the New Testament. Wow. I'm going to stop right here. <laughs> One, because my head is totally <laughs> stopped up and I just got a text that the technician is on his way right now. But what a great um, uh, imagery in the in Exodus 27 of that courtyard. God is saying, I'm going to bring a courtyard together. You're going to be able to come. I, I'm going to gather people together. You're going to be able to come in my presence because of the sacrifice, which is in, indicative of the sacrifice of Christ. And we're going to be together. We're going to be one. And in the New Testament, we see the fulfillment of that in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And we see the gathering of those of the ecclesia, the called out of God. And in that, the intended purpose of God is to create a new humanity that is formed in Christ. Wow. And all that from the courtyard in Exodus chapter 27. If you like what you heard, like and subscribe. We're here every morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is where we get into the word of God.